no, I just make it sound big like this, you know, and, I, and you psychologically feel you've got the big neck, big shoulders. And I said, oh, this is terrible writing. I don't recommend Scrumpy, you fucking guys. <laughs> <laughs> If you didn't know already, the voice actor of Heavy Weapons Guy, Gary Schwartz, recently recreated the iconic Meet the Heavy video in real life over 15 years since the original with Shork. I was lucky enough to be the cameraman or the director of photography on these shoots just like last time. And I also got to sit down with Gary and discuss how I felt to revisit this piece, his own career journey, how he does the heavy voice, and his own children's novel, as well as what his favourite sandwich is. Unfortunately, my own mic failed, but Gary's is fine and that's what really matters, so I hope you enjoy this and future projects. Thanks again to Gary and Shork, and without any further ado, let's meet the heavy. Hello. How are you? I'm all right. So I basically wanted to talk to you about, first off, the shoot we've just done. It's been quite a long few days, but how was it revisiting Meet the Heavy after all this time? Oh my goodness. It was uh, really a lot of fun. You guys did a really pro job in terms of putting it together. I've been on a lot of different shoots and very low budget shoots, and you guys pulled it all together pretty amazingly. I'm very impressed. I can't wait to see the finished product. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's been quite a bit of a hectic time, but I'm glad we got to pull it together. That's it. Well, you you know, this is guerrilla theater, you know, this is guerrilla production. Exactly. I mean, lots of stuff didn't go exactly to plan, but we just kept going. And it that's it. Well, you know, that's what I teach is improvisation. So yeah, you exactly. improvise. Yeah, so like with, with your improv, like you mentioned at the panel, last time of PAX, PAX East, yeah. you found improv to be quite therapeutic, and that's how you kind of found a passion for it. Yeah, well, improvisation, uh, uh, you know, s developed my talent as an actor. Uh, before, before that, I was uh, a mime, yeah. and uh, I wanted to stop not talking. And uh, so I started taking acting classes. And then uh, when I found uh, Viola Spolin by just an accident, you know, uh, found and took her first class, it changed my whole worldview, my whole view of everything. And myself, uh, why I'm acting, what acting is, everything. Going from like learning improv with her to teaching it, did you learn loads more teaching it yourself and watching how other people can grow? It's very rewarding to once you've had your breakthroughs to create a circumstance where other people can have their breakthroughs so their discoveries are theirs there i'm not spoon feeding any information or any i'm not doing it you i was setting up the situation and guiding somebody else to have the same aha moments that i had and when i see that happen it's very rewarding. Yeah, it must be because, I mean, as a mime, you started it was at age 13? I started at age 13 as a mime, yeah, so yeah. You learn so much, so you know kind of exactly where people are at in the talent, the industry. And like well, mime is a very different skill. It was the first skill I developed to sort of show off and to, uh, you know, make make people think I was, uh, you know, worth, worth something, in interesting. So how did that come about? If you were well, in the industry at 13, how did you find out that you wanted to do mining? Was there any influences you had before? Oh, well, I watched television. Yeah. And uh, I, I would watch the great uh, clowns on television. Uh, Jackie Gleason, Dick Van Dyke, Red Skelton. These are names probably now this generation has never heard of, but they were my big influences and I would just copy what they did but you know I was also entertained watching them and I said I want to I want to do that I want to do that yeah. and then I would do that to my friends in school I say I saw this on the Red Skelton show and it's this little pantomime and then I would do a man you know uh, looking through the window glass you know uh, at his wife who just had a newborn baby and they go you know and he's like looking and he's going you know which one's mine you know and he go that one Oh, no, 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 not that one, that one, no, no, that one. And then he'd look and he'd go, no, not that one, no, turn it around. You know, and it would, uh, and I could get the same kind of laughs that uh, he got on TV, so okay. it was great feedback. Because it's such physical comedy, do you think I transferred into voice acting? Well, you know, when, I, when I'm when i acting, uh, voice acting, I can't not be physical. I mean, the characters, I you know, you see the drawing of the character 
and how they move and how they, you know. So the first thing you do is you make your body feel like the character, and then the voice comes. Mm. So like with Harry, for example, yeah, what can you do with your body to? I have to make my arms bigger. I have to, you know, I have to be bigger. I have to make my neck this big, you know. No, I just make it sound big like this, you know, and I. And you psychologically feel you've got the big neck, big shoulders. When you were learning to mime from TV, since then you've learned, uh, you've been on TV, you've done stuff on stage. Well, yeah, well, uh, pantomime got, so when I, I went to uh, Los Angeles, I found myself in Los Angeles, uh, you know, I became a street mime and I would busk on the corners and uh, then I found a, a teacher, a mime teacher, and I got involved in his mime troupe. I met my partner. Caleb Chung, and we became a mime comedy duo. And uh, But by that time, I had been doing mime for 13 years, and I, I was bored with it. And so I asked Caleb, I said, you know, uh, I'm going to do all of the sound effects for your mime, because he was a much more physically brilliant mime than I was. Uh, he was a gymnast, and he was he had OCD, and he was very, his movements were great. And so what I would do is I'd get on a microphone and I'd make the sound effects for him. If he'd saw wood, I'd, you know, <laughs> you know, if he opened a car door, I'd say, <laughs> you know, and I'd make all of the sound effects and he'd start the engine. <laughs> We created like uh, an extra dimension for our pantomime. Yeah. And then I said, you know, let's talk to the audience. No, 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 no. Uh, so let's get rid of this white face. We don't need it. And slowly we became a comedy duo. And uh, we both started talking to the audience. And I got the talking from the audience uh, from improvisation, which is a theater style where the audience is involved. You ask the audience, who am I? Where am I? What am I up to? What am I doing? And so all of these kind of led me to improvisation. Yeah, I remember you saying uh, the panel once again, like you kind of want to make the people you're working for laugh themselves and uh, the improv, and even in voice lines is what carries it a lot of the time. You came up with a lot of the jokes for the heavy, for example. Oh yeah, and I did it on this shoot, you know. Uh, if, uh, you know, if Shork didn't yell cut, you know, I, I try to ad lib a little line and make you guys laugh. I think I did it, didn't I? Yeah, definitely. You fucking guys. You fucking guys. Fuck. She jumps high, she jumps low, she jumps a little in between. And your previous characters all like from Jungle Book, just when you whip that out um, and you just have the Low impressions. Oh, yeah, when I would do Bravo Fox as yeah, heavy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm heavy weapons, though, Bull. I am heavy weapons, though, Bull. <laughs> and this is my weapon. She weighs 150 kilograms and fires $200 custom tool cartridges at 10,000 rounds per minute. You couldn't afford to shoot her. I also wanted to talk to you about your book, The King of Average. Yeah. Because I, I read that recently. You um, did, you read it. Oh, wonderful. I think I was going to meet you and I had some questions about it. Yeah, well, you know, you didn't grow up in this in the United States, so a lot of the slang terms yeah. and some of the humor probably maybe went over your head a yeah, little bit. Uh, probably. I mean, I was going to say one thing that I really liked about it was the imagery. Yeah. Particularly at the beginning, because the James is in such a... Uh, kind of down mood at the start. And oh yeah, um, yeah. He's uh, he's got a, a mother who doesn't want him, and he feels unloved. And uh, you know that reflected a lot of my childhood too. I came from an unhappy kind of family, and um, I had that thought uh, that was the spark for the book. I said, you know, uh, I kept trying to say I'm not as bad as people think I am. But what if I was? I know I can't be great, but what if I was average? And then I started thinking, what if I was the most average person who ever lived? And then that little paradox of being the most anything doesn't make you average. Yeah. 
And so uh, I had that idea when I was 11 years old. And I then uh, the in, the books that influenced me, like the Phantom Toll Booth and uh, Roald Dahl uh, stories, I came up with my own idea for an adventure uh, to go on. And as I wrote it, you know, I put in a lot of the wisdom of the therapy that I had as an adult trying to unwind my childhood. Yeah, I, I, I think I picked up on some of that as well. Obviously, I wasn't in your therapy sessions, but yeah. one thing that called out to was like um, the different characters seeming to be different thought processes, like Killjoy. Yeah, they were all aspects of a different psychological yeah. uh, position, you know? Yeah. And the landscape itself was uh, the landscape of psychology. There was Lake Inferior and uh you know the sea of doubt yeah absolutely. and um the un impossible mountain range with mount impossible being the tallest peak yeah. and beyond the mountains is the realm of genius you know and so uh we create i created like a map yeah, the start, yeah you know and uh then you you find the little village of epiphany where you have your aha moment as a matter of fact the the spiritual leader of the village of Epiphany is named Aha. Yeah. And of course, his uh, brothers are named Yeeha and Haha -ha and yeah. Woo Pee. Well, the characters and I guess you can call them creatures as well. I thought they were really imaginative and the way you made them uh, kind of speak in a certain way with like capitalization and accents and stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, picture the voices in your head. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, you should listen to the audiobook, which uh, I recorded. Oh, there you go. So I did hear the voices in my head. I hear the voices, and then the characters just write their own lines, uh, which is, a, you know, improv training and acting training really helped me to write the book. Yeah. And I'm not writing dialogue that nobody wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. It's dialogue that's easily sayable. Yeah, it felt really natural um, just reading it. With the writing process, how did you like originally decide, like, oh, I want to write a book? Well, you know, I kept telling people the story of this book idea that I had and one Christmas I was at a Christmas party and there was a corporate guy there who was a corporate uh, sort of uh, coach corporate coach and I said you know I had this story and I written the first like you know 50 pages but I just can't get beyond it and he goes hey I challenge you you can write me 30 pages in a month that means you only have to write a page a day and I challenge you to write me a page a day of your book and I said you're on and then after 30 days, it just all gushed out, and I had a 250-page manuscript by the end of it. And then I started passing it around to people, and because I was so proud of it, you know. Uh, but everybody was not impressed with it, and so then I reread it, and I said, "Oh, this is terrible writing." And so I put it in a drawer for about two years, and then when I pulled it out, and I just wanted because I the, I love telling the story orally. Um, I reread it and I said, you know what, I need a writing teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I hired, a, on the internet, I hired a writing coach. And she read my manuscript and gave me extensive notes. And it took me two years to go through all of her notes. And about the fifth or sixth draft of the book, she wrote me an email saying, congratulations, you have a book. That's amazing. And then I started sending that manuscript out and, and I got a publisher. That's amazing. Like the dedication to get through that. It was a, you know, it gives me it gives me gr huge respect for what writers do. It's not just scribbling and saying that's brilliant. Yeah. It is honing and crafting and every comma, every word, what's not needed. You know, I kept saying uh, the editing process just whittled it down to the point where I said, you know, if I keep doing this, I'll have a haiku. Yeah. Just, just yeah, just yeah. the 17 syllables. That's all you need. But I got it down to uh, 50,000 words. I've got a few uh, fan questions. Sure, sure. Would having some drinks help with Better Man's voice? Would having some drinks? Yeah. Not really, no. believe it or not. Um, it might make me think I'm better. <laughs> <laughs> but not even confidence, just, uh, but, you know. You need your wits about you when you're doing this, when you're acting. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I don't, I don't recommend Scrumpy as an inspiration, as an inspiration maybe, 
but not as a writing tool yeah. or an acting tool. Definitely. Another person asked, what's your favorite kind of sandwich? <laughs> ah, it is a BLT, mm. and sometimes even with slices of avocado. Can't go wrong with that, ever. One person said Demo's voice was pretty similar to the one they did for the Jungle Book game. Yeah, that's where I came up with the... Uh, with the character for the Jungle Book. Um, uh, I auditioned for the Jungle Book, which was an early, early video game, uh, kind of where you, you know, you have to put puzzle pieces together to yeah. advance through the game. You're the one that's supposed to save the jungle? Forgive me for saying so, but it looks like you're having trouble saving yourself. This was in the 90s, and, uh, it was semi live action with cut ins yeah. of the of the film, and um, uh, the character they said you're Colonel Il Guam, and Il Guam is Mowgli spelled backwards. So oh, you know okay. the the player finds out that they're Mowgli at the end yeah. of the game. And um, but he said you know so you have the wisdom of Gandhi, and. Um, and the courage uh, and daring do of a Sean Connery. Uh, oh, and the humor of a John Candy, Yeah. right? And um, so I went into the audition and I said, I have all three of these things, but I, I have the wisdom of Sean Connery, yeah. the humor of Gandhi, <laughs> and, and they laughed and I got the job. That's amazing. What about Heavy's voice? Heavy's voice, uh, when I studied uh, learning how to do gibberish in uh, improvisation. You learn how to speak in gibberish and communicate your ideas, mm. but not using real language. Yeah. My gibberish always came out kind of Russian and Eastern European sounding, because I guess my grandparents spoke like that. And so when I speak g uh, uh, gibberish, it sounds very Russian. And... Um, then uh, also when I started uh, looping, doing voiceovers on movies, I looped, I was good with accents. And so I uh, picked up a Russian accent and was cast as a looper on the movie The Russia House starring Sean Connery. And the Russian actors that I was working with said, your, your accent is pretty good. So you had the validation. <laughs> so I had that validation. And uh, so then when I saw the character, uh, the Valve description, and yeah. it said, you know, he's uh, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe. He comes from somewhere in Eastern Europe. I just put together yeah, Romanian, yeah. Balkan, Russian, whatever sounds like heavy. Yeah. No, you know, it's not true Russian, but it's, uh, it's a mix. The Frankenstein Yeah, it's all of those accents mushed together. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, that's been so good. I read the book uh, about a month ago. Oh, wonderful. Well, get the audio book. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a good listen. Yeah, definitely. And I do all the characters. Listen to me as a goat, as Mayor Culpa, and I'm the king of average, and I'm, uh, I'm Killjoy. Yeah, I really recommend anyone to read that, actually. <laughs> Thanks. And if you read it, everybody, you know... Put, an, put a review on, on Amazon. I could use the, I could use the, uh, uh, the likes. Yeah, definitely. Okay? Yeah, thanks so much for the interview. Sure. I appreciate it. I know it's been quite a few long days. Yeah, it's been a lovely time. Yeah, thank you.